For those of you attending with us for the first time, we've, been, uh, we've recently started a study through the Gospel of John. Uh, we've got some reading schedules and, and tools you can use available at the welcome station out there in the foyer. Uh, but we're taking a study through John, kind of a chapter per week. Uh, for this week, we're looking at John chapter 3. And for the first five weeks of this study, I've been really happy to feature some, uh, some great scholars who are giving us some helpful angles in getting the most out of our study with John. So uh, just launched this morning. You should have an email from me if you're on the email list, but Mark Powell from the Harding School of Theology, uh, he's talking about what John's gospel teaches us about God. So I asked him to speak on the topic of, you know, how do we read John theologically? Uh, John is a very theologically dense book. And so uh, Mark is providing some insights into what John's gospel uniquely helps us to understand about God himself. I would also mention that this is the fourth contribution by Dr. Keith Stanglin, where we have kind of a running audio commentary each week on each of the chapters. And so prepping for next Sunday, we're going to be looking at John chapter 4, and Keith Stanglin once again is our partner on that journey. If uh, you're not on the email list and would like to be, you can always learn more at our website. Just click the quick links tab or uh, kingscrossingcoc.com slash John. So here in John chapter 3 kind of the bigger topic going on is the topic of hiding. And now, when we're talking about hiding, we're not just talking about an individual who's, who's led a life of crime and has something he really needs to hide. We're actually talking in context about a person who's a, a pretty above average person, someone who's lived a decent life, but just the same. Even when we live decent lives, there are some ways that we might even try to hide ourselves in plain sight. And those of us, and I would very much identify as an introvert, but those of us who are introverted, perhaps more often than others, there's a lot of different ways that that people try to hide themselves. Uh, Maybe you're present in a situation where you recognize as other people are talking that the dominant opinion in the conversation is not the opinion that you hold, and you don't feel like an argument, so you just opt to kind of be quiet and not share an opinion at all. Maybe you avoid eye contact with people, or if you make eye contact, you very quickly look away or look down and just kind of avoid going deeper into that conversation. You ever seen anyone who likes to kind of hunch over or slouch? And maybe you feel uncomfortable. I've been kind of bad about this. This is something my wife stayed out after me over the years about, Mark, you got to stand up straight. You know, sometimes I, if I get nervous, I might kind of hunch over and you kind of make yourself small and try to be a little more inconspicuous. We do that sometimes. Uh, Maybe you spend your life just waiting for everyone else to initiate conversation. Not that you're unwilling to talk, but you're never going to start the conversation. Someone's got to talk to you rather than you talking to them. Or maybe once you're in conversation, you never get below the level of just the, the, the easy chat stuff, the small talk stuff, and you don't ever really share anything about your lives, your feelings, your interests, or your deeper thoughts. Maybe one of the ways we hide is that we actually tell ourselves bad stories about other people. Well, here's the reason I don't need to get to engage them, or here's something about them I don't think I care for, and we just try to make sure that that contact never happens in the first place. But here in this passage, Jesus is talking to Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a high-ranking Jewish leader, but John mentions to us, he says, this conversation takes place in the dark. Nicodemus comes to him at night. And again, so, so much in John, we have these, these recurring themes, light and darkness being one of the big ones. But this is one of the first times where we see John using darkness, not just as like a metaphor for evil, but saying here, even in the cover of night, Nicodemus, this prominent person, comes to talk to Jesus. And what they talk about is the need for every person to come into the light, That even if we've led a good life, we might still have parts of ourselves that we're hiding or ashamed of, and the invitation for everyone is to come into the light. And that's what Jesus talks with Nicodemus about, to stop hiding. John chapter 3 and verse 1 says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. 
That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. So in this conversation, it becomes clear that there are several ways in which Jesus and Nicodemus seem to be on different pages, both in what they're talking about and their understanding of the things that they're talking about. Uh, The first of these things has to do with a certain word that Jesus uses. Throughout John's gospel, John loves using words that have double meanings. And when Jesus is talking to Nicodemus, what he says to him, he uses a Greek word, anothen. He says, you must be born anothen. And that can mean two different things. Now, for whatever reason, most translations have opted to go with the first of those definitions, which is born again. But in fact, the more common usage of this word in Greek means from above. So what he says here could be taken either of those ways. When Jesus says to Nicodemus, you must be born anothen, it could mean you need to be born again. But it could also mean, in fact, would more likely mean you need to be born from above. Now, looking at the way the conversation goes, it's very clear that Nicodemus leans into the first of those definitions, doesn't he? He just starts asking that question. Why, that sounds kind of absurd to be born a second time. I can't just, as a, as a grown person, you can't just go back inside your mom and be, be born again. That's kind of a strange and, and ridiculous thing. He doesn't seem to catch on to what he's talking about. So that kind of leads us into a second way in which Jesus and Nicodemus seem to be in different places in what they're talking about. And I don't know exactly the best titles to use for this. I would say it's something but like the difference between the literal and the spiritual. Not that there aren't literal spiritual truths, but Nicodemus is caught up in the realm of all just the physical possibilities, the this, this world possibilities, when Jesus is really talking about something from on high. He's talking about something that's spiritual, something that's different. Not only do you need a new birth, you need to be born on high. God needs to be involved in this process. Rather than only thinking about the literal and the things within our control, we have to open ourselves up to the spiritual nature of our lives, that there's a whole other dimension to us and that we need to be tapped into God and the Spirit of God and the presence of God to help us be changed in our hearts to receive this new birth that we're offered. So there's this difference between the the literal and the spiritual. So in uh, verse 9, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and we bear witness to what we've seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And I'll push pause for just a second. There's another one of those beautiful double meanings because you could talk about the lifting up in the servant of the serpent that Moses did, which is how the people uh, found healing from this terrible plague they were enduring. He references that, but then we think about Jesus being lifted up on the cross. But do you know that same term lifted up is also something you could use of a resurrection? So John loves playing with multiple meanings uh, in these passages. But he says, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. So again, Jesus is uniquely suited to show us the way to God because he is the one unique individual who has come down from heaven. He has come down from above, from God. And so here again, we see another dividing point between what Nicodemus is thinking about and what Jesus is really talking about. We could say it's the difference between knowing and mystery between wanting to have total certainty in your life about things and then having things that you just have to be open to because God moves in mysterious ways. You might notice in Nicodemus's comments to Jesus, though he's meeting him at night, to his credit, at least he is getting with Jesus. He's exploring this person. He's not judging him too quickly. He's trying to, to hear him out. But you know, one of the first things out of Nicodemus's mouth is, we know like, here's what we know. Here's what my traditions are. Based on what you've done, here's what I'm confident of. Jesus responds by talking about what 
We don't know. He says the Spirit of God, it comes and blows, it comes and goes just like the wind blows, and you don't really know where it's coming from or where it's going. He says that's what it's like to be a child of God, that there's this mysterious, exciting aspect to what it is to be a Christian. And Nicodemus is kind of hanging on to the certainty. Well, here's the things I know solidly. And Jesus is saying, yeah, you can know that, but there's, there's more to it. You're going to have to have some faith in this journey. There's different things going on here. And more often than not, many of us prefer certainty, don't we? And it would absolutely be the case that when I talk about the Christian faith, I mean, there are definite things I would point to and say with confidence. Here's, here's what I believe and here's what I, what I believe about it. Here's why I believe it. But then there's some other aspects where putting your hand in God's hand and traveling along the journey, I know who's leading me, but I don't always know where I'm going to end up. Isn't that the case? We just have to trust God as we move into his future, but he's the only one who knows precisely where we're going. So I asked that question earlier about, you know, some of the ways that we hide, how we hide. We also have to ask that deeper question of why do we hide? I mean, there's, there's those behaviors that we have, but why do we do those things? Why do we hold back and act ashamed? Sometimes um, it might just be because the existing structures around us, whether that's at your, your office or the city or the country or whatever, whatever structures exist in our lives, sometimes your part in that structure is just comfortable enough where it's easier not to challenge it. Not to, not to rock the boat any, just to kind of go with it. And even if you don't feel good about it, it's what everyone's doing. And so we just don't want to rock the boat or stir anything up. So we kind of put our heads down and, and keep moving forward without wanting to pay attention. Sometimes it's just easier to maintain the structure, especially when it benefits us. Uh, maybe it's the fear of being truly known. Like if I came out into the light and people saw me as I really am, they wouldn't like everything that they see. Maybe it's that discomfort with being really known as we are and that fear of rejection. Sometimes perhaps you've known a person who really was living in a place of pure self-delusion where they have lied to themselves to the point that they really believe a false view of the world, that they bought so much into the lies around them that they just don't even have the ability to see the truth anymore and that when we describe ourselves, it's just living out a delusion of what we've seen. And unfortunately, maybe to some degree, we've just settled for a lukewarm life. And we say, well, as long as I'm not actively trying to hurt anybody and I'm not actively trying to bother anybody, why can't I just focus on me and do what feels good and do what I feel like? Just kind of a lukewarm, not really committed to anything other than what kind of makes me feel good temporarily. So think about Nicodemus in this circumstance. As soon as we are introduced to Nicodemus, John tells us this is a man who is a Pharisee, which we kind of use in a pejorative sense, but a Pharisee in this context, I mean, this is a very respected member of society. This is an expert in the law. This would be an admirable person. Pharisees had had prominent roles in leading the people, which is why they're able to argue with Jesus at such a high level. They're respected. So he's a Pharisee. He's deeply respected. He's also described as a ruler of the Jews, and he even outs himself here as a person who thinks Jesus may have been sent from God because he says, well, one thing I know is these signs you're doing, you couldn't do these things if you weren't from God. So he has some level of faith, but Jesus invites him to this new birth, this birth that comes from on high. So the problem with what Nicodemus is doing is that he's kind of open to Jesus, but he only wants to accept Jesus in such a way that allows him to maintain everything else he's already got going. You know, I like the structures of my life. I like what power I think I have. I like the sense of control I have over myself. And Jesus is saying, if you really want to experience a birth that comes from God, you're going to have to get comfortable hanging on only to God, not to your credentials, not to your title, not to the other things you use to secure yourself. And just trust that God is the one who holds the future. To be born again, to be born from on high, means having to embrace God's future for you, not just the future that you've tried to craft for yourself or maintain control of. It's this experience of radical love that shapes us. I always believe that uh, the Apostle John, as he puts together this gospel for us that we're studying through, I think the order in which he puts these stories is very intentional. And it's often the case that if you look at one story, if you want to catch the deeper meaning of it, try looking at the stories on either side of it. So we're having this conversation with Nicodemus here at night, 
about the importance of being born again, being born from on high with his heart that's been affected by heaven and the love of God. And then he immediately shifts over to John the Baptist. And I would say he does this to give us a positive example of what it can look like when a person has had God really come into their hearts and change them around. John the Baptist is someone who just has an entirely different view of the world and his place in it than anyone else you encounter much of the time. It says in verse 25, now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. So what would a normal person's reaction be to that? Well, they got more followers than I've got. They're getting more likes and upvotes than I'm getting. They're paying more attention to him than they are to me. Now, the, the fleshly response to that would be irritation and fighting and scrapping, trying to get to be king of the hill again. John doesn't do that. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. What a heavenly mindset. What an incredible perspective to be able to have, even in the moment where everyone else is panicking and saying, oh no, you're becoming less. Less people are talking about you. More people are following that guy. And he says... I'm, I'm like the best man at the wedding, and I could not be happier for Jesus to connect with the people who need him so much. I want him to become greater, and I want me to become less. Just an incredible perspective. He doesn't let his ego be out of control. Even though he's a person with some notoriety, fame, he's making an impact. One thing that John tells us that's important to remember, he says, you know, every single good thing you have in your life is something that's a gift from God. And he would tell you it's not only true of, of the things that are just seemingly innate, it's also true even of the things that you've done and you've earned. You know, we all have to ask that question. You know, of all the things you might say about yourself, that I'm some kind of a self-made person, you know, when did you decide to be born with a fully functional brain? When did you decide to be born healthy enough where you're able to work? When did you choose America as your place of birth where you're able to have so many opportunities for prosperity? When did you get to pick your family or the people who invested in you to get you to a position where you could make good choices in your life and you had the opportunities that you've had? Which of those things did you do for yourself? You know, even the things we build on, fundamentally, John the Baptist is correct. Every good thing you've got comes to you directly from God be thankful for it. Don't lose sight of that, that everything we have, it's all grace. It's all God's mercy. I'm watching a few of you smirking at this image. I love this old African proverb that whenever you see a turtle on a fence post, know that he did not get there on his own. That's all of us, isn't it? If you look at any of the things we've accomplished, the one thing that could truly be said of every person is, you know, I had a lot of help to get where I am. There's a lot of people who helped to put me where I am. There's people that God surrounded me with to help me get to where I am. So um, we've been talking about this idea of being born again, born from above. And I want to remind us of a few of these concepts that are kind of floating around. We're talking about being born from above, having God's heart, God's love come into our hearts, change us and shift us. We're talking about the need to be open in our spiritual selves to becoming more authentic people. We're talking about the need to embrace the mysterious nature sometimes of following God who defies our expectations in wonderful ways, often defies our ability to grasp exactly what he's like. We also have to let go of this need for control to know that I've got everything exactly figured out the way that I want it. So I was thinking about the significance of being born again Sometimes it's helpful for us to look at a pretty extreme example of something where you might say, I'm different than that person, but somewhere along the spectrum, I can kind of see myself having similar needs. Um, there's, a, there's a guy named Gregory Boyle I've just become aware of in the last couple of years. Uh, Boyle is a Catholic priest who has spent the last several decades working in the most dangerous part of Los Angeles, specifically working with gang members. And he's worked for years trying to help them find a path to a better life. 
uh, there are some really gut-wrenching stories he shares about maybe it's a person he's working with and it's like they finally get it and they're making some better choices and maybe they've got their first real job, but because of where they live, they, they're not even caught up in gang violence. They just happen to be standing on the wrong corner at the wrong time and two other people are fighting and someone he's been investing in gets murdered. Uh, he's talked about how many funerals he's performed for these gang members he's come to love as he's worked with them. Uh, it's, it's a powerful work, but there's all kinds of things they've started doing trying to create opportunities for these gang members. At this point, Homeboy Industries, which is his ministry, they have electronics recycling, they have a bakery, they have what they call the Home Girl Cafe, they offer catering. If you need t-shirts, they do screen printing, silk screening, embroidery, they have a diner, they have a grocer, grocery, they also run a farmer's market. Uh, they do a number of things quite similar to our own uh, prison ministry efforts, classes in things like uh, anger management, trying to help people enter the world in, in more healthy ways. They help people get their GEDs. There's a lot of good work that they're doing. I wanted to show you a video clip. And in this clip, because it's a newspaper doing it, the clip doesn't emphasize the spiritual aspect of what's going on here. But I think if you were to talk to any of these people, they would tell you personally, of course, God has a hand in what's changing them and giving them this new life. So um, if we could go ahead and roll that video clip, I'd like you to watch this and think about what we've been talking about. Because I was so caught up in the, in the gang life and being on the streets, running around, I had no time to hear anybody out. I was angry and wanted, I wanted to go with people that would recognize my anger. I felt empty. I felt alone. I felt no one had my back. I, I remember I had to ask my mom, what happened? What'd you do? Why'd you leave us like that? These are the reactions of hurt people. And that's what I am, a hurt person. I walked in and I walked out because I was so nervous. I couldn't handle what the atmosphere that was here. Healing is not just, you just arrive. It's a journey and it's, it's constant work. I stopped being who I was and I started changing little by little. Sometimes you have to leave, leave your barrio, like move out and explore other things. That's the struggle. I mean, I see my old friends. I see a lot of, a lot of the old people that I used to see around there. It's not about forgetting where you came from. You, you have to remember where you came from, but you can't attach yourself to it. It's letting go. We're not used to that. We're not used to being received with love and compassion and, and kindness and kinship. The minute you begin to love yourself and you get a taste or a sense of the healing, then you're able to dream again. Once I have my kids, it's like, they help me so much. Like, and I tell my kids that because they're old enough to understand. And I tell them like, do you guys know you guys helped your mom change herself? You know what I'm saying? And it's really the truth, you know? What do I want? That's the question that you wake up yourself to every morning. What do I want to be now? I still don't know where I'm going. I, I don't know where I'm going. But I know it will be in a good direction. Yeah, so thanks for, thanks for watching that with me. I, I think about some of the themes we've been talking about, the power of love in a person's life the challenge of uncertainty, but the hope that can be present in uncertainty when we walk hand in hand with God. Uh, one of the people that uh, Boyle tells a story about, his nickname was Speedy. And he says, Speedy was a guy who just had absolutely everything stacked against him in his life. Really dysfunctional home setting. There was violence. There was abuse. Uh, there was hurt. There was anger. There was every possible bad influence around him. He had every reason to just end up as another statistic. But fortunately, by the grace of God, Speedy was someone that he found and worked with and who started making better choices. And so Speedy ended up marrying a girl named Claudia who'd been his girlfriend, and they've kind of created a better life. He has a steady job. And he was catching up one time with Speedy, just asking, you know, how is your life going? What are you doing now? And he says, Speedy told me, he said, you know, one thing that my family does now, every week we go to church on Sunday, and then we go to Barnes & Noble and hang out for two hours. They said, now I'm way too cheap to buy my kids all those books. And so we go and re we read the books there at the store for two hours. And then the next week, most of the books are still there. So we just pick up where we left off and read for, for two more hours. But he said, you know, um, my kids started telling me that there was this new Harry Potter book coming out. And they just really wanted to get this Harry Potter book. And I said, 
okay, why not? And so I splurged, and I bought him this Harry Potter book. He said, you know what we do at my house every night now? He said, every night we turn off the television, and I sit in my recliner, and I listen to my three children read to each other. And the oldest one, my oldest daughter, reads one full page of the book, and then she helps my middle child, my son, read one paragraph, and then the two of them together work with the baby, and they help that baby to read one sentence. And then they just keep taking turns as they work through the book. And he says, you know, I sit there in my recliner listening to my children, and I think to myself, how is my life this good? How is my life this good? The power of a second chance, the power of a new birth and another opportunity. So if you've been living in darkness, as you heard some of them talking about, coming into the light can be frightening. If you don't know what real love, genuine acceptance is like, it's hard to know what to do with it. If you have things to be ashamed of, coming into the light can be a matter of something that even feels threatening when you have things you'd rather keep hidden in the dark. But when we choose to come into the light, what we find is a God who already loved us where we were. Even when we were sinners, He still sent Jesus to die for us, that He wants to meet us where we are and wants us to have that powerful second chance, that next opportunity, that we don't always know where we're going. I loved what that last one said. I don't really know where I'm going, but I know with God's help, it's a good direction. It's a good direction. And so as we leave Nicodemus in chapter 3, we're actually going to meet Nicodemus again later in this gospel. This is some great storytelling. But where John leaves it right now with Nicodemus is that he met Jesus in the dark, and as we see Jesus have this conversation with him, you can't help but ask that question, I wonder if Nicodemus is going to come into the light. Is he going to come into the light? And that's the question that I think God is asking to each of us. It's the invitation to each of us that you need to come into the light, and that when you come into the light, you're going to be met with love and help and acceptance and even the possibility of a new birth from on high that only God can provide. But we also have to come to God. We can't keep avoiding Him. And so in your life, in whatever way that needs to take place, however it is that you need to move towards the light, I want to encourage you this morning to take that step. So whether you're a person who has never named Jesus as Lord and today is the day you want to become a Christian or you've been a Christian a long time but you see there's still some places that you're just hiding in the darkness and you say, you know, it's, it's time for me to be a more authentic person, a more open person because I'm confident in the grace that God provides or I need the help that the church would offer. Uh, whatever your needs are this morning, if you'd like to respond by coming forward, you're welcome to. While together we stand and sing.